which brought home this issue of security. On the 27th of December, 2012, I received a call on my cell phone from the police. The police called me to inform me that my house had been broken into. Someone had broken while I was visiting over the Christmas holiday, I had gone to visit my family, and they were calling to tell me that my house was broken into. And, in fact, they, some, the burglars came into my house and they took some of my wife's jewelry. It was a very uh, scary feeling because it was at least three hours drive from my, where I was to, until I would be able to be home. Now, the interesting thing about this burglary was that actually I live in a neighborhood where many people can see my house. And what had actually happened is there is outside of my house, it is very visible. People can, all my neighbors can see, see it. And of course, inside my house, all of the doors were locked. My, 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 uh, my alarm system was good. But in between the place where my neighbors could see and, the, and my house, is a small area near my front door which there are many plants, many uh, small trees, shrubs growing around that area and the burglar had turned off the light by removing the light bulb and as a result no one could see the outside that the burglar was working to get their way into my house and eventually break in. In the bias world we have a similar problem. That problem is called security. And where this happens is, we all know that the firmware is pretty secure. It's in the flash. Nobody can really change it easily. At the same time, we have the OS. And the OS presents its own security, right? It has its own security. But in between, there's a small area between the firmware and the OS where if someone wants to break in to burglar my house, to burglar my system, it is in the place where we hand off from the firmware into the OS. Just like between, it was between the area where my neighbors could see and inside my house there was a small place. So a secure boot is an important technology because it addresses that small area where people can attack my system, steal my secrets, make me feel scared. So that's why Inside has uh, spent a lot of time thinking about this and why UEFI has spent a lot of time thinking about this. There's been a lot of progress because in 2012, we saw the significant shipment of a large number of secure systems. This is true both in Windows, uh, Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012, where the addition of security into the firmware is seen as one of the significant value reasons why people might want to upgrade their systems. Likewise, with UEFI versions of Fedora and Ubuntu coming out, why Linux, uh, people might want to upgrade to the newest Linux distributions because they implement security. Now, in 2012, a lot of good things have happened. First, the firmware vendors, the firmware is, has, has become uh, ready for secure boot. Both the system platform, like the kind that Inside produces, or the kind that appears on option ROMs. The hardware vendors have uh, been consistently moving forward and adding secure boot onto their platform and also the plug-in cards. And of course the operating system and the software has added support for this as well. But this has taken a pretty consistent effort by everyone in this room to make that happen. So I want, we want to take a, a, a step back and look at uh, maybe a refresher course because we've seen also some pretty interesting uh, failures this year in secure boot. So let's talk about this here. First of all, Booting with UEFI already has a significant amount of value. Uh, we already can boot larger than 2.2 terabyte drives. We can already support complex partition structures with UEFI. We have the ability now to remote boot over IPv6. We can uh, do Pixie provisioning and boot from iSCSI. These were things that really were, uh, were possible maybe with legacy bias, but now they are possible pretty much with everyone who uses UEFI. And of course, error reporting and management. Now, UEFI boot offers those advantages, but in order to, you also need secure boot in order to lock down access to the critical boot files. We're gonna show you about how you can check up your system in a little bit. First of all, you have to plan from the beginning that your system is going to be secure. I think that uh, 
you know, we all recognize that it would be good if people couldn't attack our systems. That would be good. It would be good if no one could break into my house. That would be good. But in order to prevent uh, breaking into your house, you have to do some planning, right? In fact, after my house was broken into, you can bet that my wife and I thought a lot about how to make my house more secure. Maybe we should hook our alarm system up to, the sent to a company that will respond automatically if the alarm goes off. Maybe I should have a, a better door. Well, same thing is true with our platforms that we're going to ship. You have to plan to make it secure, starting with the firmware and going all the way through the boot process. All right, so what's secure boot? A lot of you know this. This is, this is nothing new. Uh, you should have been hearing this message over and over from people. But first of all, it is a technology built into UEFI to eliminate major security holes during the handoff uh, between the UEFI firmware to a UEFI OS. Now, if you remember in the legacy world, right, the way that the legacy would boot up uh, an OS is just load one sector off of the hard drive or off the CD, and whatever was in it, we would jump in, jump and use it. Uh, option ROMs also, uh, you know, what if I take a iSCSI card and I plug it in? Normally, in the legacy world, we would just execute whatever was on the iSCSI card. No matter, so I, if I could put an iSCSI card in your system, I could break into it. So option ROMs and OS bootloaders need to be signed by a private key corresponding to a certificate within the system security database. What this means is, no longer do I just trust any OS loader or any plug-in option ROM. They need to be signed first, and the firmware needs to have something in it which tells it which should I execute. The database is always provisioned at the factory, and it's maintained by the OS. OK, here we go. First thing that has to happen, you need to have your driver signed. What is a driver's signature? It is actually following an industry standard which says, when I take my, my image, whether it's a PE, uh, PE cough, a driver, I'm gonna sign it, I'm gonna calculate a hash of that, and I'm actually gonna encrypt that hash and store it in a certificate, and that's actually part, becomes part of the PE cough image. So right now I had to have that signed. Second thing I need to have is, we said that the firmware needs to know who should it accept and who should it not. In UEFI Secure Boot, there is four databases. There's the PK, the platform key, there's the key, uh, KEK, the KEK, the DB, and the DBX. Now the most important ones are these ones over here, right? This one. This tells me, this contains a list of all of the people who I'm gonna let in. And this contains a list of people, or contains a list of people whose if their certificates I'm not going to let them in. The DB let, says yes, the DBX says no. Okay. Now, how do I get into this exclusive club? Well, first of all, you need to make sure that the system, when it's built, when the firmware that's built has the correct list of the certificates showing all of the people you want to say yes to got to have that done. It's usually done in the factory because otherwise you ship out the system, the end user gets it, immediately there's, someone attacks, put something else there instead. So the system comes with a certificate. The same time, the UEFI drivers are signed by a certificate authority. Now the certificate authority is someone we trust, and when they sign it, they're the ones who sign it with the private key. If you know security, you know that, that uh, the person who holds the private key, that's the important person because the private key is, the security is all in the private key. So the certificate authority provides a mechanism for signing UEFI drivers and embeds that signature into the driver. The UEFI firmware is the one who takes the certificate in the database and it takes the signature that's in the driver checks the driver out, does it generate the right signature, and then it matches that against one of the certificates that's been installed in the database. I'm going through this very fast, because I think most of you know this. Now, one of the, the question is, who is the person who has the private key? Who's the one do I trust in this case? Well, the first person to step forward in this uh, was Microsoft. We needed a widely trusted certificate authority. Microsoft had the experience to do this. Uh, my, we, you know, UEFI Forum went through a number of steps trying to find out if they could find another certificate authority. 
that was uh, reasonable, didn't cost a ton of money. It turns out Microsoft was the most reasonable one. Uh, Microsoft manufacturers are encouraged to put their certificate into the allowed database, the DB. And Microsoft's policies aren't discriminatory. They're not going, oh yeah, if it's um, you know this is Android, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna issue a certificate because it's Android. No, no, no. They they issue it to everyone, including the the uh, bootloader that's being used in many of the U the Linux distributions today is signed by the Microsoft CA. Could there could we get another certificate authority out there? Possibly. It's not, there's nothing. There's nothing stopping another certificate authority from generating this and signing drivers, uh, but they would probably have to convince the uh, OEM to include that certificate also in the ROM. There's plenty of room in the database today, so it's not like uh, someone else couldn't do it. It was just that Microsoft was the one who stepped up to the plate to do this. So this is important because th by establishing this handoff between the UEFI firmware and what comes later this is what allows you to make sure you have a secure operating system environment so for example with Linux uh, you have your UEFI firmware and it's it got a certificate and it's looking at the boot shim the boot shim is that small driver which is signed for Linux which uh, is signed by the Microsoft certificate authority it can boot it now it in turn is going to check the signature of the next thing which is the Linux bootloader. And then the Linux bootloader is in turn going to check the signatures of all of the, the Linux drivers which follow on after it. So what you have done is you've established a chain of trust starting with the firmware, going up all the way until the operating system to make sure, sure that everyone who loads is trusted. Microsoft's uh, story is very similar for Windows. You have the UEFI firmware and it verifies the signature of the bootloader and then the bootloader, in turn, verifies the signature of all of the OS, uh, all of the OS drivers and, and such, which come on after that. So what you do is you're making sure that you don't you have a consistent story. We even heard uh, you talked about the uh, PSP. PSP adds another layer in front of all of this diagram. If it would go off to the left, the left, right? Uh, um, but UEFI talks about the UEFI firmware starting a chain of trust, which allows you to make sure that the when you're when you get all the way up to the desktop. Every, all the pieces of code that need to be secure up to that point have been verified. Now, how do you make sure that your system is ready? I'm going to show you this in a, uh, in a minute. But uh, we provided a tool, uh, which you, and it's in beta right now. You can sign up for it with that email address, appsupportedinside.com. And basically, this tool will check to show you, it's called uh, Secure Checkup, will check to see what's in your current database whether your options are turned on, is secure boot enabled, uh, what certificates are in your certificate database from underneath Windows, so that you can take a look and see, make sure, hey, is my system really ready? Uh, is it really ready to go? So at this point, uh, just I'll show you in a second, I actually have a system here with it installed. For a UEFI forum in 2013, hey, this is something that's continued to go forward. We still want to make sure that UEFI adoption it is, it's one of the big things we're pushing for this year. Uh, we also want to make sure that there's a new thing coming out, Secure Firmware Update. We expect that Secure Firmware Update, which says, hey, how do I make sure when I do a flash update, the thing I'm flashing is trusted? Um, there's, I think you're gonna see pro progress in this area, continued standardization, not only of the system bias firmware, but also firmware and other pieces on the motherboard. Also, the, uh, we won't, want to continue to do this because we want UEFI to fulfill its promise, which is to make sure that all the people in the ecosystem, whether they're an IHV, whether they're a firmware vendor, whether they're OS vendor, whether they're a systems vendor, have all the pieces they need to make this work. That's why we have things like the IHV breakout later on. What are we doing? We're trying to listen to the IHVs and say, hey, is this, are these things going to work for, is UEFI really going to work for IHVs? If not, let's fix the things that are, that are not, that are not working, including things with security. One second here while I switch over my. This is a. Uh, UEFI system and it's already booted. Probably can't see this too well, but this is uh, running inside a, a secure boot under Win 8. You can see no warnings. Secure boot is enabled, is the Microsoft Keck and certificate and uh, all present in here. What's the setup mode? 
you know, the different boot options. So this just, this just shows you what's currently in there. You can get more detail. If I go over here to, this is, this is not a production system, so, uh, but you can see this is actually all the different certs that are in here on this system with the name. You know, here's the UEFI owner grid. Here's what's in the DBX currently. Uh, or here's what's in the DB, that, that sort of thing. So if you use this utility, you can check and see yourself what's in here. You can also check to see what your current, what your current boot order. You can see on this system that I have uh, uh, Win8 and I have Android installed in here, both of which are secure boot, uh, uh, secure boot systems. And the other thing is this utility also gives you the handy little option. You know that in the UEFI specification, there's the boot into firmware flag. This actually lets you set that little that flag and reboot the system so that you can go straight from here into your setup utility on your platform. If they support the, the uh, OS indications flag, they'll be able to go straight from here. So it's a useful utility, a useful checkup utility. It also lets you change things like the boot order. Uh, so you can, and that's exactly what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna set this. You know what? I'm not going to try to do this. So, including in secure boot mode, because it's powered on. This is coming back up and winning. help if I set the thing next time but uh, so we're back up here again so this and anyway this is the main thing is this utility will show you what's in your system you could whether you're doable you can change the boot options and change the boot order and uh, if you want a copy of this like I said send your uh, send it to apps uh, app support at inside.com we'll, uh, we'll send you back uh, the link on how to get a copy of this you can run on your system. it should run on any UEFI system it's not, this is not an inside specific utility. This should run on any UEFI compliance system. So, and then if you have questions, you can send it, uh, questions to that same email address. We'll get back to you. And at this point, I wanna say thank you very much. I hope you're all having secure boot systems in 2013.